Uh, before we start, I'm going to give a brief introduction about 3MT. The 3 minute thesis is a uh, skills development activity which challenges research higher degree students to explain their research project to a non specialist audience in just 3 minutes. And this, uh, the 3MT activity is actually developed by the University of Queensland in 2008 in Australia and now it becomes an international uh, competition. And uh, this year is the uh, sixth time in a row that we are organizing 3MT at, in NTU. And the rules for 3MT is listed like, uh, in these slides. A single static PowerPoint slide is permitted. So uh, there is no slide transitions, animations, or movement of any uh, description. The slide is to be presented from the beginning of the oration. Uh, oration. And we, are, we don't allow uh, additional electronic mediums like sound and video files. And also uh, no additional props like costumes, musical instruments, laboratory equipment are permitted. And uh, the presentations are limited to only three minutes. And the com competitors exceeding, uh, exceeding three minutes are disqualified. And the uh, presentations are to be spoken word. Uh, no points, raps, or songs. Presentations are considered to have conversed when a presenter starts their presentation through movement of speech, and the decision of the uh, adjudicating panel is final. We have a uh, official time. Uh, we have a timer here, so when when the presentation starts, the time the time will lapse automatically. And please keep your time to be within three minutes. And we invite three professors to be in our judge panel. Uh, first one is Dr. Thomas Kavisa from School of Computer Science and Engineering. Thank you. And the <laughs> second one is Dr. Uh, Sugenza from School of Electrical and uh, Electronic Engineering. invite Dr. Andrew Greensdale from School of Material Science and Engineering. <laughs> the judge, uh, we have five the judge criteria. First one is comprehension. This, uh, the presenters need to uh, clearly describe the key results of their research, including the conclusion, conclusion and the outcomes. The second one is uh, content delivery. Uh, the presenter needs to communicate in a language that appropriate to to our uh, intelligent but non-specialist audience. The third one is the engagement. Uh, the presenter needs to uh, drive enthusiasm among the audience and make them want to know more. And uh, we judge whether the presenter capture and maintain audience attentions. We also judge by the communication. The uh, the, we, we judge that whether the presentation is well organized and uh, well placed, did the presentation follow a clear and uh, logical sequence. The last criteria is the presentation. The, the presenter needs to give sufficient stage presence, eye contact with our audience, vocal range, maintain a steady pace, have a uh, confident stance. So now let's give time to our presenters. First of all, let, uh, let's uh, give a welcome to Chuan Chun Yang from SCBE to give his presentation. Sorry, are you able to move further? Yeah. 
uh, the middle of this screen. Ah, uh, yes, correct. Because the, so the camera. Can. <laughs> okay, can. Sorry, are you ready? Shake the sound. Hello. Shake the sound. Carbon dioxide has been present in the Earth atmosphere since 400,000 years ago, and showed that the environment is sufficiently formed for the survival of living organism. So, nonetheless, since the 19th century, because of rapid industrialization, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has shown a significant increase in the concentration over the years, which has led to severe environmental events, for example, the melting of ice in North and South Pole, the rise of sea level, and extreme weather events. Industrial process, for example, in the energy generation, the world industry are still relying on the conventional energy resources, for example, the natural gas and fossil fuels, which by burning these particular components will generally release a substantially large amount of carbon dioxide. So, therefore, if these carbon dioxide residual presence and fuel gas are not released, are, are just released straight away to the atmosphere, it will lead to the effects as you mentioned earlier. So, therefore, in the industry, typically it has a fuel treatment system that allows the concentration of carbon dioxide to be absorbed first prior to be released in the atmosphere. However, the current uh, concentration treatment system has suffered some limitations. For example, it requires a strong energy penalty. It means you need to supply energy for the subsequent uses, which is not very economical. So research that has been conducted to now has been focused on the development of nanoporous material which this nanoporous material has shown some competitive advantage as compared to the current conventional fish in process in terms of the energy requirement. To have an idea what this uh, nanoporous material is, we can use a simple analogy, which is a sponge that has been built uh, in this portion or even the cleaning of pores. Because the presence of this sponge contains some pores, which these pores allow the water or even the detergent water to be trapped inside, and it can allow a more effective of the increase in the accessible surface area. So if we use a similar idea and we develop this hot porous material in a nanoscale range, so that means we are able to absorb this carbon dioxide because of the increased accessibility of this uh, material. So however, the current research that has been conducted has relied on the more simplified measurement conditions. For example, the measurement conditions are just based on pure carbon dioxide as a but in the industrial operation, there could be the presence of other impurities that, if it's not being carefully investigated, it may affect the performance or even diminish the performance after rapid switching operation. So therefore, this thesis can serve as some useful idea on how the performance of this nanoporous material uh, will be affected if there is a presence of impurities. Questions toward this presentation? If not, um, any comments from the judges? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's give some time for the judges to write the comments. And next uh, presenter will be Ian Chai, he's in the panel.
Let us welcome Amy Chai to the Beginning Choral Presentation. Okay, so as we know, one in nine sec sec uh, secondary Singapore students suffer from cyberbullying. And bullying, cyberbullying is part of bullying as we know that. However, the difference between cyberbullying and online, uh, cyberbullying and face to face bullying is that these students suffer cyberbullying 24 7 and they can't escape it. And many, uh, many research has shown that students who suffer from cyberbullying consider uh, committing suicide or suffer, suffer from uh, health issues, mental health issues. The question would be very simple here, right? We would say, ask ourselves, since cyberbullying happens online, why can't we just tell our students not to go online? And that's precisely why our students usually tell us that they are suffering from cyberbullying, because they're afraid that adults and teachers will force them to forego their social activities online and they rather suffer in silence. So today, my research is about finding ways to protect the victims that do not have the courage to speak up, and finding ways like in the PowerPoint slide you can see there, to allow the majority of people who are bystanders to be able to look out for signs, or to see a victim that is suffering and stand up for them. It would be a lot easier for the bystanders to stand up because they're not being targeted. But it would be very difficult for us as a victim to stand up when everything seems so daunting and difficult, especially when they're teenagers and they feel like they have no one to go to. So basically, what I did was that I wanted to understand what is the true issue and not come up with my own understanding. So I worked with seven students in a school and they acted, they, they were co-researchers with me so that I could understand what they really felt. And I asked them the key question: do you stand up when you see your friend being? And most of them said, we wanted to, but we didn't. I said, can you find out more? Why didn't you stand up for your friend? Especially if that friend of yours is your good friend. Wouldn't you want to stand up for that person? So they went around and they interviewed other people, and they also write their own self-reflection, and they discovered something. There were many reasons why they didn't stand up, for their good friends or people they didn't quite care for, but there was many reasons. One of them, they felt that their parents told them, it's none of your business. Be quiet. Protect yourself first. Second reason, so that would be self-preservation. The second reason is the victim maybe deserves it. So it's victim blaming. Right? So there were there were these reasons that stopped them from doing it. So the question was how do we get them to overlook these reasons? And they, they went researching and they, they shared with me that there's only one thing that can supersede all these inhibitors that stops them from wanting to stand up and to do the right thing. The one reason is that if the student sees that the bullying on the victim has such severe consequences that they would want to give up their lives. They would stand in. So the question today is, the question today is, can we get our students to empathize and heal? And so far, about 25% of my research have shown that they wanted to stand the upstanders. Thank you very much. Welcome, uh, Tan Delving, to begin her presentation. Okay. Hi. Have you guys ever wondered or ever noticed that there's actually a lot of koi in um, hotel ponds and all sorts of water features all around Singapore? Have you ever wondered how come they are here and, what, and how did they actually manage to uh, survive? 
Koi is from Japan, which is a temperate country. And Singapore is obviously not temperate, it's tropical. So how on earth are they actually being uh, kept alive? Right? And we all know that koi is actually a very expensive fish. So if they are actually all over Singapore, why are they actually not more prominent? Why are they not actually, like say, a localized version? So the story I'm here to tell you today is that koi actually was very important in Singapore's uh, economy. At, uh, ever since the Japanese uh, Prime Minister gave Lee Kuan Yew a pair of koi in 1969, koi has actually become part of our ornamental fish industry and has improved, I mean, has increased in terms of economic value since, the, since that time. However, in 2000, however, in 2006, something happened. A koi virus disease that was specifically targeting koi actually um, happened, right? it appeared. And it killed about 90% of koi in, in the US. So one of the things that Japan was really concerned about was this disease moving into Japan. So they actually developed a protocol to uh, prevent the spread of this disease in Japan. So Singapore, being concerned about this disease, also uh, adapted this protocol from Japan and moved it to Singapore. So how did they actually deal with this disease? The thing is, Singapore already has dealt with animal diseases such as swine flu and avian flu. And the main, the main uh, strategy they do is they actually would cull all infected animals. So that is what they did. They took the protocol from Japan and decided to cull all infected koi. And, but the problem is, because koi is an ornamental fish and it's not a food fish, the farmers in Singapore had to wait for the government officials to actually get around to them. They were dealing with the pigs and birds at the same time, so the koi was actually at a much lower uh, priority for them. So for Singaporean farmers, a lot of their uh, business was actually spent waiting around for months, and this affected the koi industry. So what I have to say is, actually when they're moving animals or moving lives, they actually need protocols and they have to be adapted to the local environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, any comments from judges? If no, uh, next speaker is Edison from Chigoi. Please give him a call first. I don't need the microphone. Is it okay? I promise him that the lecture theater next door will hear me. <laughs> Is it okay? And it's like I'm flying. Sure. Uh, whenever I can start, please. That's your slide. I'm sorry? That's your slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Is it a robot speaking here or a human? This might seem to be a strange question right now, but in the very near future, it will not be a strange question anymore. We will see many, many intelligent robots all around us in the very near future. If you put a robot in this room, in the garden, or on the streets, in these different places, you expect these intelligent robots to behave differently, right? Place recognition is a fundamental problem in, for the mobile robots, for the robots that move from one place to another place. My research is on place recognition for mobile robots. For the past few decades, Scientists try to solve this problem by looking into the camera frames. And in this limited window of camera lens, they look for the details such as the corners, intersections, lines, and whatever that can describe this picture, which ultimately will be the place. But there is a problem with this technique. These features are sensitive to environmental 
uh, changes, such as the changes in lighting condition. In the morning and at night, these features are completely different. They are not consistent. Throughout the year, in winter and summer, of course not in Singapore, but the environment is very different. I solved the problem very, very differently. I use LiDAR to see the environment. I send laser beams to everywhere around the robot, and I see the reflection. And this way, I can see the surfaces of all the objects around the robot. And these surfaces are colorless, and therefore, they are not sensitive to lighting condition anymore. But since I do not have colors, what will happen to the key features? Let's leave our surfaces, colorless surfaces, for a few seconds. Imagine I'm playing a drum, and I'm listening to this drum with a digital magical ear that can list me all the possible frequencies that can be heard from this specific drum. Interestingly, this list contains a lot of information about the geometry of this specific drum. Now let's go back to these colorless surfaces. Think of them as all shaped drums. Let's play them all at the same time and listen to them with the same ear and list these frequencies. Just like the DNA structure containing biological information, this list also contains all the information about the geometry of this place. This way, I have a technique to recognize places which is not sensitive to environmental conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, any comments from audience judges? Well, uh, the next speaker is. Well, actually, yeah, this is, uh, frankly saying, listening to the shape of the objects around us briefly means that listening to the uh, frequency of vibration of circuits, which is something very common in different engineering fields. So this is like more specific to computer science. It's rather new in robotics and computer science. It seems to be deaf in the sort of techniques and things like that, so certain, um, certain fish use. So they use a variety of essentially sonar radar type techniques. And they, have, they call these electrical signals as waves and different things. I believe it is possible to do it this way. You know, laser is much more accurate than acoustic signals. Of course. Yeah, and then, of course, of course. And then you, you know that the surfaces that we can capture through laser or LIDAR will be very, very accurate. So when, when we look into the vibration of these surfaces, the result will be very accurate. Well, we, we do essentially laser reflection through the train, and that's not a tool like possible. Of the ambient light. It is a phase. There is, we, we cannot escape from it. 
So this, this slider actually eliminates this color thing, but as I mentioned, also removes this feature. But I'm telling you something. The best would be that we can have a full RGB, a 3D RGB reading, that means a laser reading, which is also contained with color information. That would be fantastic. We are currently working on making this sensor for the first time. I mean, there are many RGB sensors, but none of them can go up to 100 meters, which is necessary for the robotic application. We are currently working on making this sensor in our lab too. And it was developed. For night time use? I'm sorry? For night time use? For everything. Even for the daytime, because you want to eliminate the, 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 the light condition. If you are in the sea, you want to see something which is a kilometer away from you. The lighting condition can totally affect the color and the, the color of the object, which is one kilometer away from you. But if you see it with laser, first of all, the surface can be perfectly visible if you have enough resolution, which, well, if I feel you can have unlimited resolution. And if you can have the color at the same time, we cannot have it right now, but we think it is possible to be done. Then that becomes a very, that's going to be a problem. That's going to be a problem. Space is being power. It is in fact being power. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, professors. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Pratiba Das from IGS. Can you really imagine how big the number 33 million is? This is the population of some big countries like Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and my friend. This is the number of people who are suffering from cancer in this world. Among them, 5.6% are suffering from liver cancer. Liver cancer is the fifth most common cause of death in industrialized countries and sixth most common type of cancer diagnosed in human. Researchers from many years have been trying to find out a cure to give an answer to this cancer. However, the commercialization is not very easy. Researchers need to cross too many hurdles to commercialize their drugs which they have invented in the laboratory. For doing so, they have tested their drugs in different animals like mouse, pigs. But these mouse pigs models, which are called animal disease models, are not able to replicate efficiently the complex cellular behavior of our human body. And at the end of the work, they need to sacrifice the animal. Here come my work. I am trying to prepare a model which can able to cure different type of cancers. In my model, I am using a three-dimensional matrix. This three-dimensional matrix I have prepared by electrospinning process. It have a fibrous network structure and it can able to mimic our body extracellular matrix. In this matrix, I have already cultured liver cells and these liver cells can grow happily on this matrix over one month and they can able to maintain their functionality throughout this time. My model is not going to require any kind of animal sacrifice. It just only needs human liver cells and these liver cells are easily available in the market. Finally, if we are able to optimize the system, we can able to overcome the sacrifice of the animals for our research purpose. And if we are able to optimize the system, just only by changing the orientation of the fibers, we can able to achieve the matrix configuration of different body parts of our body. So we can able to use this matrix. 
matrix to scan different other kind of cancers as well. Thus, my friend, if I able to come with this matrix, we can use the drug directly to the human cells and it will not be a challenge anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do judges have any comments for for Pratima? The cells are commercially available. We can get it from the market. Actually, there are uh, in in the different hospitals when people come for the cancer treatment during uh, they take out some part of the liver and uh, from there they collected the cells purified and they sell it to the market. It's, it's cancer cells. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Yes. okay, actually, in this system, we can create the artificial tumor's condition. It's not the exact. Uh, thank, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. And thank you, um, Pativa. Next speaker will be Karima Goya from IGS. So let's start with something philosophical in the scale of science. Consider the surroundings around you. What do we have? Animals, plants, trees, and us. Now consider a situation where one of us starts growing monstrously. Any of it, be it animals, be it trees, be it us. So what we are going to do? We are going to use all the air, food, and the water around us. What is going to happen to other organisms? They are going to die. And that's my friend is exactly what cancer is all about. P of the normal cells starts growing enormously, monstrously. So what do I do? I do something less opposite, less from what my maid Pratiwa does. She cures it, I detect it. So how do we detect it? We detect it using the nanoparticles. And what this nanoparticles is, it's just simple gold that we wear around. So we turn it, we tune it, and we add our recognition element to it. And addition of this recognition element detects what these cancer cells excrete. So basically what we are doing, we are using the excretion products of our normal cells which turn out to be cancerous. And this detection is done at a very early stage. Why is it required? As you can see from the slide, the early detection of cancer reduces the fatality, the mortality, immortal, mortality by from 90% to 10% to 20%. So that is why early detection is required. Now, is it simple? No, research is never simple. Uh -huh. So this, uh, because, this is not simple because the products are excreted by the normal cells as well. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to track those markers that are produced enormously by those cancer cells. So first we ch check out the biomarkers and then we tune in our nanoparticles according to their detection. Now we are trying to turn it out simple. How are we turning it out to be simple? We are using the cell phones that we, everyone has. I think no one here in this hall is without a cell phone. What we are trying to do is we are trying to check the color change and that color change when clicked on your camera is going to be analyzed by a software which tells you that you need to rush to a doctor for your cancer detection cells. And that that is what my research work is all about. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, do our judges have any comments? If no, then uh, thank you. Uh, our next speaker, Kumara, he isn't feeling well, so he has left. Uh, so <clears throat> let's move to the next speaker, Mew uh, David. 
Please give it a round. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had to go to the doctor to get um, some routine tests or to uh, maybe you're having some symptoms and you don't know what it is. So you need to get a blood test or something and the uh, doctor has to draw blood. So for those of us that aren't masochists, uh, we don't really like this because maybe they use a big needle, they can be painful when they stick you, uh, they have to take a vial of blood or three, and then moreover, you have to wait for one week, maybe more, uh, while the test results are getting um, read at another lab, and then you can get the results. Uh, but if, what if there were a way uh, that we could get the results using less blood, and maybe the same day, or even in the same room, or the same same doctor visit, you get the results faster. Um, I'm what I'm working on is trying to make this uh, a reality. So the method uh, that we're using involves uh, shining light at metallic nanostructures and looking at the, looking at the, the color of the light that is uh, reflected or transmitted through. And uh, depending on what you want to test for, of course you can coat these metal nanostructures in uh, biomarkers for um, certain bacteria or viruses uh, or even cancer. Um, so. We, this is not something unique that we're doing. Uh, a lot of people do this type of work, but what we are doing uniquely is uh, the fabrication method with nanostructures. When I say nano, I mean uh, 1,000 times thinner than the human hair, or arrays of such structures, as you can see in the image in my slide. Uh, the method that we're using is electrodeposition, or electroplating, which maybe some hobbyists might know, but uh, sometimes the people will use it to make gold-looking jewelry that's really just a cheap metal on the inside, but uh, looks, fits gold on the outside. Uh, we're using this method because it is cheaper in term, uh, it's cheaper than other similar methods for, for fabricating structures because uh, it's inherently cheaper, but also we use less material and we're able to grow the structures uh, taller. So I'm doing uh, simulations and fabrication of such structures uh, to, to see what works out the best. And currently, we are, uh, our collaborators are working with uh, doctors at a hospital in Singapore to uh, test this uh, for biomarkers for thyroid cancer. So uh, hopefully we can see some results uh, soon. And it's, it's nice to have clinical collaboration. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. Uh, do judges have any comments for David? Okay, thank you. What kind of uh, we're not looking at viruses. Um, we are, uh, right now, we're just mostly, we're mostly testing with, uh, mostly testing with just standard antibody antigen combinations that, that are available. Uh, <coughs> ones that a lot of people are using to do, uh, to do plasmonic type of testing. Um, as far as the specific biomarkers that they are using for their cancer testing, I'm not sure if the, the collaborators know that. So, um, the structures that are that, that we make are that we use. So, I'm not so much in the biological aspect of it. Thank you, David. Thank you, Professor. Our next speaker is Ekta Jain from MAE. Please give it up.
Automobile industries have seen a tremendous growth over the years, and the number of motorized vehicles on the roads are increasing exponentially. Singapore is a great example for that. On one hand, there is a number of increasing carbon dioxide emissions, which severely affects the global warming. On the other hand, there are a number of increasing accidents and fatalities on the roads. Hence, a novel material, which is cheaper, lightweight with high mechanical strength, shock absorbent and crack resistant, is urgently required to solve these issues. And these issues can be resolved by quickly characterizing the materials which automobile industries are using. At present, automobile industries are using aluminium alloys, but, however, the characterizing techniques which are available are very complex to use, highly expensive, and time-consuming. Therefore, we are working on developing a technique which is very simple, yet highly effective, one-stop technique for characterizing these materials. We are just taking the bunch of optical images. We are just using an optical microscope and a light source where a sample is observed under the illuminated light and optical images are taken. These optical images are then compiled using a self-written MATLAB software. Within an hour, we are able to get the sample maps and then we can extract all the necessary information which are required to judge the properties of the material. For example, on the bottom left, the image is obtained using a $1 million setup within 24 to 48 hours. Yes, that's a lot of time. On the other hand, bottom right, the image is obtained using our setup within just 45 minutes and the cost of the setup is around $20,000. We can see the maps generated by those instruments. These are the complex materials and they have very complex structures sometimes. I believe that this technique is going to save a lot of time, money and resources for the manufacturers and encourage them to use more novel materials for the vehicle manufacturing. I think that this technique will also help the consumer to contribute towards more greener environment and yes, a safer environment. I find this as my way to help and protect the Mother Earth. This is my contribution towards the society. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do judges have any comments for her? So are there any medals from the aerospace industry that we can copy? Yes, so I choose here automobile industry as an example, but this technique can be employed in any other industry. So if they build the planes, they need a technique to characterize the materials faster, how the grain orientations are propagated in a particular material. So for that, they have to come to these techniques which can be like a microscope. But in planes, they don't use CA light. Yeah, so the materials can be the different, but the techniques available to characterize the aerospace. But they don't have the techniques now also. Uh, they, they don't, don't have, have any They don't have. Now. Okay. They are just, no. Okay. Maturity has not made that much progress. Okay. <laughs> okay. But the other thing stuck as far as I know is lithium microscopy techniques. Yeah. And the lithium microscopy are extremely expensive. Okay. Everybody knows the people are facts, as yeah. I do, knows yeah. just how much, how much this stuff costs. Yeah. Okay. Because not the moment they would be incredibly cheap. So do they need them in the same industry? Yes, they're doing exactly the same thing. But they're using exactly the same techniques. This technique will be applicable to anything that can reach for a product as well. Okay. So the cost will be higher. If they're doing for the cars, it will be higher. Well, you the cost is, well, the, the point is there is that you can sample it. You don't have to test every single piece as long as you test it. If you, and you can use exactly the same techniques also in, for example, implants. If you think of the implants, mm -hmm. and metal, metal implants are based on metal. So this is a way of scanning the metal surface. So if you can reduce the cost and increase the throughput, any industry where you need to scan a surface will be benefited. Okay. Okay. It's obviously the material capitalization yeah. technique. Okay. The car is just designed to put people in understand. Yeah, I just chose that as an example. It can be applied in any way. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Thank you.
radio provinces. Our next speaker is Elena from Jiboyi. Please get prepared. Imagine this, you are inside a space shuttle shooting up out of the Earth's atmosphere at 30,000 kilometers per second. 
a speed nine times faster than the average vacuum with it. You escape the atmosphere and you're out there in outer space, floating. You look around you. What do you see? Is that a planet? Do you want to go closer? Well, you can't. Why? Because you're not really there at all. No, you are sitting in your living room watching all of this play out when you wear your virtual reality headset. Now, this, ladies and gentlemen, is the power of virtual reality, VR today. It immerses you in a world that is different from yours, making you blind to the world around you. Now, imagine if you could have gone closer to that planet. Imagine if you could have zoomed into the planet, twirled it around with your fingers. Imagine that. Imagine if you could have interacted with this exciting new world in front of you. Now, but how? How do you communicate this with the VR headset you're wearing? Well, what if I were to tell you that you could communicate, you could talk with your VR headset using only your own body? Well, my research in VR focuses on using just what is already out there to interact with VR headset. That is, the headset itself and the phone inside it and ourselves. Now, how do I do that? Firstly, I implemented tapping on the surface of the VR headset. Each tap would create a different vibration, so these can be detected as tap gestures. Next, I created hand and eye gaze gestures on virtual reality headset. Typically, these need additional sensors, but my system works on a smartphone camera alone. Imagine having to, I mean, imagine if you could type numbers just by looking at them and perhaps click them just by pinching your fingers like this and then tapping to exit. Now, combining all of these different modes of interaction together would create a multimodal virtual reality system. Now, imagine going inside it to interact almost as if it were your own reality. This is the moment from which you turn from a passive observer of the system into an active participant in that world. And that is exciting because of all the potential it has to do good. This is the direction of my research in virtual reality. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Um, do judges have any comments for her? Yes. I was a bit strongly advise you alter the gesture you're showing in number three. In many cultures, that is an extremely obscene gesture. All right, thank you, thank you for that. Try showing the way right. or something, sure. okay? Sure. But where I come from, if you do that to somebody, you are, you are basically telling them what they call it, to have sex and travel, okay? Thank you, that thank is, you I think, for okay. It. That way around, you're not doing it. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Be careful. Be careful. Any hand signals in the sun falls. Very good. 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 Very Okay. 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 So in here. So I say something like waving or something, which is huge thing. Right. Okay. okay. Even, oh, even symbols that. like that are dangerous because it's rare. That's obscene. I'm so on top. Okay. 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 So be very careful with gestures. And this is, for the record, this is not the actual gesture. I'm no. Okay. Don't <laughs> show something you can't do with my. All right. Be insulted by. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for your very nice questions. Thank you. The other point I'd make is you can stop for a few seconds in the light. Yes. It's not good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Just for future reference. Okay. Our next speaker is Fernando from Agios. Please come to the stage and give it a look. And she is also the last uh, presenter today. Let's welcome her to give her presentation.
you ever thought about the everyday products that you use? Your clothes, socks, makeup and sunscreen. Have you ever come to know that nanoparticles have been added to these products to enhance their performance and characteristics? Esteemed panel of judges, ladies and gentlemen, fabulous Friday afternoon to all of you. All around the world, every day, tons of nanoparticles are entering into our water bodies. You may think, what can these tiny dots impact on us? But I assure you, it's time to rethink. With the usage of engineered nanoparticles in the consumer products, their presence in the water bodies have become inevitable, mainly due to the washing process. In addition, disposal of garbage and micropollutants to the water bodies. Together with the micropollutants, nanoparticles meet many other organic matter and microorganisms in the water. Then, these nanoparticles tend to undergo different transformation as a result of interactions with these compounds. If these transformed nanoparticles are not properly treated or removed, they can enter into our bodies through inhalation, ingestion or physical contact through the skin, which can cause chronic and acute health issues due to the accumulation in the body. Now, I hope all of you understand the importance of studying the transformations of nanoparticles in the water bodies. My research focuses on understanding the fate of nanoparticles in wastewater, specifically silver nanoparticles, which is recorded as widely spread in wastewater. During my study, these transformations have been classified into three categories. Number one, photochemical and chemical transformation caused due to the sunlight and the chemicals or residues present in the water producing free radicals or active compounds harmful to the humans. As a result of the interparticle forces, the physicochemical transformations take place resulting in aggregation, deposition or absorption of the particle. As the name itself, microbial transformations take place as a result with interactions with the microorganisms, helping sometimes in eliminating or populating them. Isn't it a good time to rethink whether it's a giga threat for a nano game? Over to you. Thank you. Do judges have any comments for her? The last sentence I didn't forget. Okay. Thank you. Uh, whether it's a giga threat for a nano game? Why so? Yes, uh, because uh, we have selected silver nanoparticles because it's the most widely used nanoparticle uh, in the consumer products uh, for clothes, especially socks and the sun, almost all the cream that uh, we use for as sunscreen, uh, night creams, uh, and, uh, and also it, uh, because of the different properties of silver nanoparticles such as antibacterial properties and the optical properties, it is widely used. Therefore, we have chosen silver nanoparticles as the target nanoparticle. Okay, thank you, Fernando. Thank you, folks. <laughs>
But if you're saying it for two hour lectures, not the story. <laughs> but the other thing, of course, is just be careful like you can use your jar. Okay? Okay? Um, this is like the problem solving people using biological things. Okay? So try to keep it simple, but a label is missing in the same. So they try. So you've got to be very careful. So what is it is not jar. Okay? He needs something called labels, sometimes tricky. Okay, so I think some people have the people have good reality that you don't need to worry about it so much. Yes. But the trick thing we need to decide to be medical. We will look at what you do in the wrong words. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Andrew, for uh, those valuable suggestions. Thank you, professors. So uh, now I will briefly introduce the following schedule. We have semi-finals in July 6, in, uh, the venue is LT10, and the NTU final will be in July 20th uh, at LT2A. Uh, I hope all of you can get good results. And uh, the Singapore final this year will be in National University of Singapore on July 27th. Thank you all for attending today. Thank you.